before we move on to the next session, we would like to uh, thank our bronze partners. Uh, that is uh, BRAINS, spelled with two I, Austrian Economic Center, Free Private Cities, General Bytes, Crypto CBD, and the Mercatus Center. So thank you so much for our sponsors. A round of applause for them. Thank you. And our last keynote speaker is uh, a very special guest. Uh, Lezek Balcharovic is uh, an economist uh, teaching at the Warsaw School of Economics, Dr. Honoris Kaiser of numerous Polish and foreign universities, former president of the National Bank of Poland, and former deputy prime minister and minister of finance in the first non-communist government of Poland. He is not able to join us today in person, but he will be uh, with us live via video. Um, uh, Professor Bolcherovitz will discuss the path from communism to capitalism. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today via the live stream. Uh, this session will last uh, about uh, 30 minutes and we will also have the ability to ask questions. For those willing to ask questions after the presentation, uh, you, uh, if you want for Mr. Bolcherovitz to see you, you can come to the front uh, of, the, of the stage and uh, there will be a microphone available to you. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Bolcherovitz. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry that I could not join you personally, but I hope we can communicate this way. <clears throat> Let me first say that you are witnessing the barbaric aggression of Putin's Russia against the freedom-loving Ukrainians. And every decent person must support the heroic battle of the Ukrainians. What is going on now in Ukraine, I think, reminds us what are the worst combinations in human history. It is a bad system which is headed by a moral monster who created or developed the system, like Hitler in Nazi Germany, Stalin, in Soviet Russia and nowadays we are witnessing Putin and his Russia. <clears throat> I hope and I am sure that Ukraine will prevail with the help of uh, many, many people from the world, including the Western world. <clears throat> now, I will, of course, start with discussing what has happened after the collapse or disillusion of the Soviet Empire, but let me first make some other remarks, and I would then go beyond uh, the post-Soviet transition. <clears throat> Let us start with Marxism, which was an intellectual folly, but became very popular among many, many Western intellectuals and some workers. This was, in fact, an anti-scientific, quasi-religious ideology, and one might, well, should wonder why and how it could become so popular, but it, it is the fact that it dominates the minds of many people. <clears throat> now, contrary to Marx's predictions, Marx has won, not in the West, but in the Tsarist Russia, because of disarray in this country and because there was a gifted, unscrupulous intellectual whose name was Lenin. <clears throat> no time to describe what was happening. It is enough to say that Leninism gave rise to Stalinism, which was extremely and especially harsh for the Ukrainians. Millions and millions of Ukrainian people have died under Stalin in the 20s and in the 30s. After the Second World War, the Soviet Empire has spread and included the Central and Eastern European countries. <clears throat> now, uh, it was based on fear. Uh, generated by secret police, 
and produce backwardness, but also military power at the expense of the people. One should remember the heroes, the dissidents, in the, during the times of the Soviet domination, both in Russia, like Sakharov or Mr. Kovalov. And I have listened very carefully and with emotions to what, to what has been happening to extremely brave, brave individuals, people in Belarusia. <clears throat> we should remember and support the heroes. Now, there was not much hope. Even in uh, the late 80s, that this empire of evil would dissolve. But from time to time, you have nice surprises in history, and something very unexpected has happened. But in 89, started first in Poland, solidarity, and then 91, when the Soviet Union was de facto and formally dissolved. And the former Soviet Republic, Republic became independent countries, including uh, Ukraine, Belarusia, Georgia, and other other countries. <clears throat> now, this uh, marked the beginning of what is called the post-socialist transition. I would not go into details. There are many, many books, but let me look at it with a bird's eye. One can distinguish two aspects of this transition. First, political, which includes uh, the extent, the reduction of the political power, the rule of law, the media, etc. And the economic aspects, which refers to the role of the state versus private markets in the economy. <clears throat> On the political front, again being very, very brief in general, I would say that initially and for some years it seemed that uh, all the former Soviet republics becoming independent countries were establishing democracies. In other words, elected government, which of course requires the rule of law. <clears throat> but things have started to change. In Europe first, as far as I remember, with Belarusia and Lukashenko. Uh, and in Russia, especially beginning with 2010, with the rule of Mr. Putin. And nowadays we are also observing uh, a crowding out of uh, general democracy in, among other countries in Hungary. The difference between Belarusia and Hungary is that uh, in uh, these two last countries there is an open dictatorial power based on secret police and intimidation, while in Hungary it is the distortion of the electoral process and domination of most of the mass media which ensures the victory of Mr. Orban. So it's very, very the elections, but they are very dishonest and unfair. <clears throat> as far as economic transition is concerned, there has been huge, huge differences in the economic growth. So, for example, Poland has been growing pretty fast, and now uh, its per capita income is at least three times as high as it was. In the 30s and some other countries, of course, Belarusia, but so far to some extent, Ukraine has been growing much, much slower. And there is a lot of analysis which point out to the reasons of these differences in economic growth. And the main reason was the extent of the economic freedom, market competition, inversely related to the state interventionism. But an optimistic note, one can say that countries which have been lagging in economic reforms have huge reserves for future economic growth if they reverse the course. And I am sure that uh, Ukraine, after it overcomes 
the Putin's Russia aggression can grow very, very fast uh, and catch up with the more advanced, economically advanced countries. <clears throat> now, let me now turn to a broader subject, which I think is fundamental. If you look at the world, then we see that huge differences in the quality of life, meaning economic life, economic standards, but also extent of fear, are not related to something which is called national character or culture, but it's first of all caused by huge differences in the institutional systems or regimes. Look at South and North Korea, the same nation, the same culture, but unbelievably large differences in the standard of living, both economic and non-economic. Look at or remember North, uh, East and West Germany, the same nation, very different systems, system, very different standard of living. So the main conclusion is you have a chance to improve your system, do it. And this requires a concentrated effort. If you have still some freedom, use this freedom to self-organize and to influence the public opinion. <clears throat> now let me uh, make, take a very brief look at what are the main types of, of institutional statistics and what are their results. Now on the economic front, I already mentioned socialism, which by definition is anti-capitalism. This anti-capitalism, it eliminates private ownership and markets, and we know for beyond any doubt that this is the world system for the standard of living, for the economic growth. And secondly, if you have socialism, meaning uh, non-private ownership in the economy, we are condemned to dictatorship, to the rule of fear. Then, on the opposite side, there are free markets, which uh, can, uh, can be combined with democracy and the rule of law, law and this was the fact in history. Free markets are pretty rare creatures nowadays in the world, but free markets have ensured a rapid economic growth in the 19th century, in Britain, in Sweden, in other Scandinavian countries, in some continental European countries. They have been subject of many attacks from the populist of status, but there is a massive evidence that the deviation from free markets in the form of various state intervention brings much more harm than benefit. And this brings me to the third category of uh, systems from the economic point of view, which are limited or distorted, but still market economies. And what do we know about them? There's a lot of empirical knowledge, but let me try to point out some points first. That on the whole, the countries of so-called third world have more distorted or limited market economies than on average developed countries. And this is the main reason why the countries of most of the countries of so-called third world are lagging. There are, of course, some exceptions, but exceptions originate when they move to more free market and less state intervention. And this is empirical. There's nothing uh, uh, doctrinaire about this statement. <clears throat> Second, both in the more developed and less developed countries, 
he has various types of capitalism. And one of the bad types is chronic capitalism, which means that uh, they are big businessmen who uh, got the riches, mostly thanks to influence on the political process. So this is very difficult to be combined with honest market competition. <clears throat> And I don't know any example of very successful chronic capitalism. Then uh, uh, in uh, developed countries, in OECD countries, you have, of course, many different experiences, but I think most of them are macroeconomically distorted. And these distortions are produced largely by the activity of the modern central banks, which uh, have introduced for many years so-called unconventional monetary policy, and one keeping very, very, very low interest rates, and at the same time producing a lot of money to finance uh, the government spending. And one of the byproducts of this policy, which uh, has to end because of inflation, is that so-called zombie companies or industries, meaning companies which can enjoy very low interest rates from the banks, and they are not subject to something which is very important for free markets, which is called creative destruction. So also in the West, in developed countries, there are some accumulated problems. And many countries, including advanced economies, suffer for excessive uh, fiscal activism, meaning excessive spending, which in the most extreme cases brings about fiscal crisis, like in Greece. Generally speaking, and uh, this is based on massive empirical literature, Economic problems in the form of stagnation of a very slow in economic growth or in the form of crisis, financial or fiscal crisis, are not due to free markets, but they are produced by various state interventions. And this is, of course, against the most uh, propaganda or communication in the Western economies. Regarding the political dimension of uh, institutional regimes, let me repeat that socialism unavoidably brings about not only bad economic situation, but also dictatorship. And social dictatorship is worse dictatorship. If you look at China, which has suffered a lot under Maoism and this uh, social dictatorship, and then it moved to de facto capitalism in the late uh, 70s, you see the difference between socialism and capitalism, even if a country is still not democratic. I am not praising China because it is not democratic. I only want to show that if you move from total socialism to market economy, you can produce a very fast economic growth. <clears throat> so what would be the conclusions for people like you <clears throat> who believe in freedom, in the rule of law? <clears throat> I think Freedom has to be defended even if free, in free society. And the freedom has to be most defended because it's the most attack is the economic freedom, private ownership, moderate taxation, moderate regulation, etc., etc. <clears throat> now, in trying, because as you know, from your experience of your, your countries, it is the economic freedom, as I said, which has been the most attacked. And one can explain why. 
Now, in defending economic freedom, you have to be very skillful in attacking those who attack economic freedom or capitalism. And I think there are two aspects. First, you have to unmask the populist language. Give you some examples. The word, the very nice and important word, the rights. Originally, the rights meant freedom rights. But then this word was borrowed or sort of manipulated and a completely new category has appeared, which is now called social rights. I am now not engaging in any systematic criticism of the social rights. I want only to say that there's a terrible confusion when you give two different meanings, a different meaning to already established word. And this brings to about confusion. So you have to clear up this backlog of manipulation. <clears throat> or the very word socialism. Socialism in practice meant abolition or elimination of private ownership according to the Marxist recommendation. But some people gave a new meaning to the word socialism. And they say, for example, also oh, socialism was not in existence in the former Soviet Union. It, con it existed in Sweden. But what do they have in mind when they say socialism Exist, existed and exists, continues to exist in Sweden. They do not explain, but in fact, they redefine socialism as a large welfare state, a large social spending. So they give a completely different meaning to already established words. But if you define socialism by a large welfare state or social spending, then every Western country, including the US, Britain, all European countries, according to this new implicit definition as socialist. So where is capitalism on this definition? When I would have to look for capitalism to the poor countries of Africa, where social spending as a percentage of GDP is much lower. <clears throat> so you have to unmask the language if you want to unmask the attacks against economic freedom. And you also have to unmask factual distortions, like, for example, that the Great Depression in the United States in the 30s was due to free markets. There's a massive research which shows that the Great Depression in the, United, in the, in the 30s in the United States was produced by various errors of policies and it was prolonged by such uh, erroneous bad policies, like, for example, protectionism introduced in the US for various interventions which crippled the supply side of the economy. OK, so much. I know I went beyond uh, my topic, original topic, but I thought it is more important to mention uh, what I consider to be more fundamental issues for the defenders of economic freedom. Thank you very much. Now the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Balcerovic, for your talk. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, online today. We, I've been just been told we have uh, six more minutes for questions. So basically, if you have a question, raise your hand, and then uh, those who I'll pick can come to the front and ask their questions so that Professor Balcerovitz can also see you. So are there any questions? 
<laughs> Any questions in the room? So shocking or <laughs> the obvious? I wonder what I, I have. I wouldn't. Or... Shocking or obvious. <laughs> Oh, I, uh, we see a question over there. <clears throat> yeah, if you come to the front here, then... Uh, <laughs> um, if you look that way, so the way the... Is the way the camera faces? I don't know. Yes, yes, I can see. Okay. Uh, my, my question would be, well, I didn't hear perfectly because of the audio. I think it was kind of difficult because of the, um, the live stream. But uh, at some oh. point, I think that uh, you mentioned a populist rhetoric. You called it populist when talking about social movements wanting social rights and masking that as freedom. Um, and I would pose the question, wouldn't libertarianism and free markets also be considered populist movements in the sense that they center around this ideology that sees the people instead of the establishment to have freedom and to have power in society. And yeah, it's just a question. Well, it depends on the meaning you give to the word populism. In the most uh, usage, populism means cheating. People proposing something which cannot work on economic grounds, like excessive spending or regulation. So this is the established uh, sense of the word populism. If you use this word in a different meaning, for example, meaning popular or appealing to some people, then you are using the same words in a different meaning and you add to confusion. So any sensible discussion requires that we know what is the meaning of the words we are using. Okay? Th thank you, thank you, Professor Baltravers. I've just been told that we have time for one more question, and I see the microphone is over there. Uh. Hi, Professor. Uh, one question regarding the economic transition from socialism to uh, market economics. We now have a widespread phenomena in the Balkans and also in Belarus and Ukraine of something that is declaratively called a market economy, but is certainly a, 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 a populist socialist economy controlled by the state. And those countries have been, have not have not com completed the transition in the manner in which it was expected. Not like Poland, Estonia, or the Baltic states. They are completely stuck in the mud to say so. Uh, how to continue, how to get out of the mud, and how to c have those countries that are now being controlled by the elites, political elites, continue their way towards the market economics if those political elites refuse to, to conduct this transition? Well, first, they are quasi-socialist in the sense that uh, economy is dominated by the political power. First, state ownership, which is dominant or very large, and you can't have market economy if most or many of your firms are state-owned. State ownership brings about political control and then regulation. So it is pretty, pretty easy to say what is the nature of the system. On your main question, I wish I knew the easy solution. <laughs> How to get rid? Because basically, if you want to liberate the economy, you would have to eliminate a better leadership or create such a pressure that even a tyrant would be afraid of continuing bad policies. But this, um, uh, I, I would not dare to rec make a more concrete recommendation. I only wish that the very courageous people in Belarusia, which risk their freedom of their lives, would prevail. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Balcherovitz, uh, for joining us today. A round of applause for our last speaker. So thank you so much for joining us for day one of LibertyCon. It was a pleasure to see everyone here today um, and uh, in our first